excited? Yes. Good, yes. Yes? Yes. Good, all right. So um, I'm excited to do this um, talk. I really like um, this kind of future where we're best going. It's kind of my part of the future that I like, so I'm excited for this. How many in this room are developers? All right, so you guys are all familiar with a little bit of PHP and the CSS and Sweet. All right, so there's uh, this presentation. I wanted to give a good foundation um, on APIs in general, and then we kind of grow into talking about building stuff uh, with the WordPress REST API specifically. So um, this is me. Uh, I have a company that's walking distance from here. Uh, Amber Detroit, we're closer to Kobo. Um, it's like a five minute walk from here. Um, we build a lot of really cool things. I love the things that we're always working on. Um, we do, I would say, about 70% of our projects are WordPress based. Um, and everything that we build is all custom. So our goals are like you know, um, custom plugin, and custom theme, or custom integration. So it's all about writing the software to be built on WordPress. Um, been doing this for a long time now. I don't think the first dev WordPress is the first time I like, you know, played with that. The PHP file was 2007, so it's been a long time I've been playing WordPress. Um, and I also, uh, as you mentioned, helped lead the first uh, three word camps back in 2012. Um, all right, so let's uh, get going. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to do a little one-on-one on REST APIs. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are all are, but I'd like to try to make sure we're somewhat all on the same page here. That way, um, it makes it a lot easier to kind of begin the conversation. Um, then we'll do a little intro into the WordPress or the REST API, what that looks like. Um, we'll create a little mini theme. Uh, we're going to talk a little about headless WordPress, uh, and then extending this to beyond what we can do with it. So uh, that's a pretty aggressive schedule. Um, a lot that I want to cover in this, this short period of time, but hopefully uh, this goes well and uh, you guys find this valuable. Okay, so let's get down to the fundamentals of what we're here to talk about, which is what is an API and uh, how does this work. So, um, the way I like to think of APIs, guys, again, some of this might be a refresher, but again, it's, it's all about um, being on the same page here. Um, we have some data, and we want to just share it, right? That's kind of the fundamental thing that we have some data. So for this example, we have you know, post titles, uh, date published, and excerpt. Um, we want to share it with people. So what do we typically do? We build a website to share the information with people, so we display the information to people on the website. Um, but what if you want to display that information on other devices, or you want that information to be accessible to multiple devices? Um, the way this is typically handled is with an API. So that's what we're here to talk about, is how you facilitate that. So when I think of an API, it's basically a proxy to the data to be, to be uh, viewed in different areas. So that's kind of what this is. So how does that look? It's obviously not pretty like a website. It's more programmatic, and it's um, this is a JSON representation, um, which is what we'll be talking about today. But what this allows us to do is now write software on top of other platforms and access the data and show it other places. So that's you know at its core um, what an API is and what they're used for. Uh, there's lots of services out there that have APIs as as example. Um, a lot more. Than Okay, so what is RESTful? So we're talking about WordPress REST API. Um, so it's important to just have a good understanding of what RESTful means. Uh, and so what this is kind of broken down is representational, representational state transfer. Um, and I, I have the four kind of main components of what this is. Um, we're going to go through each one of these um, just so we have a good foundation. So let's look at this, what this looks like in terms of uh, an HTTP request. So um, an API is basically a bunch of a series of URLs that you can hit, a RESTful API, um, and when you hit those URLs, it returns um, data back. Uh, so we have a few things that we have to break down into what this HTTP request looks like. So we have the URL itself, we have the methods of uh, typically when you use your browser and you type a URL in, you're actually using the get method. That's, the, that's what the browser does. Um, in an API, we actually, in a RESTful API, we have more than just a get method uh, to get data. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, and then we have header um, meta that you also be able to add. And then you also have the body, and that's ultimately what the request is. So we're going to walk through this a little bit more so we all have an understanding of what these are. Um, the second part to RESTful API um, is resource based. So what this means is the 
the URLs, the way they're, they're generated is typically based off of objects. So if you think of a custom post type as a resource, that's kind of the same kind of concept here of uh, how that fits into play. Um, as I mentioned before, a little bit about the HTTP requests. Um, here's an example of how you would basically get and manipulate data over an API. So you have the get, which is um, you can get a collection of posts. You can get post slash one, which is a single post. Um, you can post to create. You can use the post method to create a post, and those posts and posts um, is in there. Um, then you have the, the put and delete, which helps you update and delete those things. So these are the different methods that you're using. And uh, as we get into this a little bit more, you'll see how this all plays into the WordPress REST API because all of these things are components of it. Uh, the next part is stateless. So in a RESTful API, every time you make a call, the um, authentication happens within the call. So every call is self-contained, meaning that um, the way it typically works with authentication is um, authorization happens first somewhere, like a login, and then you have a token that you is basically pass back and forth with the API so that you can basically get the data or have the permissions to do those type of things. So um, this is also done with WordPress as well, where there's a token. And again, we're going to cover it a little bit more, but I'm just trying to cover the fundamentals here. And then we also have representation, um, which basically says uh, the objects that are returned is in a format that um, is agreed upon. This is a JSON format. XML is also common, um, but today we're focusing on JSON. All right. Um, any questions on like the foundational like, the rest stuff or you guys stuff? You guys good so far? Okay, cool. All right, so let's let's jump into the WordPress REST API and how this all comes together. So, um, since WordPress four seven, uh, the Red WordPress REST API has been available. Um, if you actually just pull up in your browser and whatever your WordPress site is and type in a WP um, dash JSON, um, you'll be able to see. The, basically the core uh, calls within your WordPress API. Yeah. So inherently, it's there for you to be used. <clears throat> so as an example, you can see here, if you add a little more to the URL, I can get a collection of posts. So this is, you know, I'm starting really fundamental here. We're not going to go into like posts and pages and other CPTs. Um, obviously, if you take one, you can assume the same for all the other CPTs that are in the site, almost, which we'll cover a little bit near the end. But, um, so here's the posts. So if you can see at the top, the URL is a little bit different. I have um, a version, and then I also have slash posts. And when I make that call, it's going to return an array of JSON objects. And each object is all the data related to each post. So that way you can use it to do something else. So I forgot I had this slide a little bit zoomed in. Um, so there you go. There's a couple examples here where I can uh, get posts um, an individual post, or I can get it in a specific category. Um, so this is really nice because uh, not only can you get it all the posts, but you can also filter by category or tags and so forth. Um, and all of their documentation in the codex is up to date, um, relatively up to date, and it does a pretty good job to help with uh, seeing all the possibilities that you can do when you get these requests. Okay, so that's kind of a, a, a little bit of the uh, WordPress REST API. So let's talk about building a mini miniature theme. Um, I realized I didn't pull my, uh, I have an example I built a, I took the 2017 theme, and this is what I wanted to do, is make the, um, kind of like the front page of 2017 theme RESTful, so that way, or using the WordPress REST API, so that way the posts are loading using the API, uh, as opposed to being done within PHP. Uh, so I think the, the biggest difference here to keep in mind is um, when you have, you're building something with a WordPress REST API, um, and you're building a theme specifically, um, by default, a theme is PHP files, right? And you're using PHP tags to display the data, which means that the server on the back end is rendering the variables for you, and then sending all the HTML to the, the browser to load the content, right? The difference now is that information is, doesn't exist on the front end. It's being requested individually through the API, and then we have to take the data, bring it into the browser, generate the set of HTML that we need to generate, and then insert it into the DOM, and hence we have the data. 
So that's how a lot of websites work today, which is like the browser is now always refreshing. It's, it's constantly doing a pull and push of data um, using the browser and then re-rendering HTML on the front end. So that's essentially um, what we're going to create today, so mini theme that does exactly that. So cool? All right, so I want to... Are these slides going to be available as you're going through? Yes, yes, I will make all these slides available. Basically, after this. So this looks very familiar. This is your 2017 theme. Um, so I'm sure you guys have seen this many times before. Um, and what we can see here is we have the posts as an example. Should have been. Should have had some prepped ahead and I thought it was already open. But it wasn't. Okay. So let's, let's just walk through this a little bit. Um, we can always dig through the technicals. But I don't know why it's not working right now. Of course, live demos for some reason. I swear everything is <laughs> fantastic. I, don't, I should have had it preloaded. That's my bad. All right, so as an example, as we, I just kind of showed you the live site, you get a screenshot as well. Um, you know, we have those posts that are loaded there. This is what we typically would see. Um, of course, it's rendered to the end user, and you just see it. Um, we're going to render it a little bit differently using the, the API. Uh, so to do this, let's talk about what you have to do within a theme. Um, I'm not going to go through how to create a theme. I'm going to have the assumption that you have a little bit of understanding of how themes are created. But let's just talk about how to add into your theme um, the dependencies that you need to do and the integrations so that you can use the you can. So um, the first thing that we need to do is we have to add some JavaScript dependencies. Um, so this is in the functions PHP file of your theme. Um, which uh, most, if not all, themes have. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're using the WP and scripts uh, action here, um, and we're enqueuing the WP API. So this is inherently in WordPress, but it's not inherently enqueued. So you have to add that. Um, and by doing that, you immediately are going to have, so this is um, in my browser console tool, um, you can see I have WP API settings. So if I make that call in my console, I immediately have um, a nonce, a root, and a version, um, which helps me get a little information I'm going to need for my API, or for my uh, development with the API. Um, so that's the first thing I included. And then the second thing I'm just including here uh, is essentially a, a JavaScript file. This JavaScript file is going to be making the requests to the API to basically retrieve information. So those are the two things that we're adding to our functions PHP to do uh, the integration. All right, so the next thing that we need to do is essentially just make a Ajax call um, to the API to retrieve information. So you can do this. This is using uh, jQuery's Ajax call. Um, so you can see I have a WP API settings dot root. Um, so that is basically taken from that variable. So by adding that um, script to your theme, you immediately have that available to you. So now I can use it in my JavaScript. Um, if you don't include that WP API script, you cannot do that, and it will work, obviously. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're adding a header. So you can see in the before send, send set request header, and it's at x WP nonce, and then I'm passing the WP API settings nonce. Um, the reason why we do this is this is your authentication. In the instance that you want the site to be able to do something such as modify a post. Maybe you want to have the ability to, on the front end, have the user modify some of the text of a post. Um, you can do that by using the nonce. The nonce is going to basically help with the authentication. Um, and what that also does is, it's, it's not going to have the user's information specifically, but what it does on the back end is it uses that to determine who the user is, whether a logged in user or not logged in user, and whether they have the permissions to do so. Um, and we'll get a little bit into that a little bit more. So 
That's the API call that's using jQuery. Um, this is pretty straightforward if you guys are familiar with doing an Ajax call. Um, the nice thing is, is WordPress actually provides a JavaScript library. Uh, they have a backbone JS client library built in. So this actually makes it even easier to integrate or work with the WordPress REST API. Um, so they provide two main things. So we have models and collections. So models like a post, a collection is a collection of models. Um, so that's the, the two things that we have. Um, so now, taking that example that we had before with uh, jQuery, um, we can simplify our JavaScript and write something as simple as this. So you can see I have post collections equals the wp.api that collections dot and then capital P posts. Um, and by doing that, I have this object that I can now quote fetch the collection. Um, and so the next thing you can also see that I'm doing here is I am providing uh, category 7, so I want to just return to me all the posts that are in category 7. Um, so this makes it a lot easier because you can do this in two lines of code um, and it handles the authentication for you as well. So you don't have to think about adding that other HTTP header. Um, this is all in the client library. Um, and you can also see as a second example, I can do um, the models.post and provide the ID and that returns that JSON object back to me to use. Cool. Yes? Do you have a repo for uh, this? I do not have a repo for it. I can throw it somewhere else. Yeah, I think it's up. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I will most likely, I, I built the, I just built the theme um, recently. So, <laughs> yes, yes. It's fresh. I was explaining to my wife why I do that. She was like, why do we I'm like, if you do that, it's fresh in your mind. You literally know everything you want to talk about. So, that is honest truth. Yes, it was a uh, like a two-hour project last night. I like put this together. But anyways, um, I will get of this, and then I'll share with all of you. Um, I'll basically just take the whole theme so you guys can go um, hack away. All right. So. Let's, let's expand upon this. So now, um, if I haven't made it clear, um, where we do these type of things is in that front page JS file, which is just, that's what I happen to call a file. This is not, you don't have to call it that. Um, so if you remember, when we queued the two JavaScript files, one of the other ones was front page uh, JS, which is what I have here. Um, so what we have now is um, a little bit of JavaScript. And so you can see what we're doing here is we have this post collection. Um, which we're getting and we're fetching them. And then we're basically then, which is kind of the open-ended, what are we doing next? Um, so that's what's kind of happening here. Um, I don't know, are you guys familiar with uh, JavaScript promises much, a little bit? Um, so the nice thing is, is this is, um, you can basically, it's all uses uh, JavaScript promises, which makes this a lot easier if you're doing a lot of things that you want to do asynchronously, um, which is nice. Okay, so what we need to do now is uh, we have this collection, right? So we have this JavaScript, this JSON objects, and we need to display it on the front end, and how do we do that? Um, so I'm using um, a small JavaScript library called SimpleJS to do so, um, but what, what we can see here is, um, I like the point, this is gonna be a little easier. Um, so that piece of code that you saw on the previous screen, is at the very bottom now. So it's the same stuff. And then I just have this function up above which is that I call render posts. And what I'm doing now is in the then that was empty before, I'm calling that function, passing those models, so post collection.models, which is that array of um, posts, passing it in my function up above, and I'm looping through each one to generate the HTML. Um, and so like I said, I'm using uh, SilverJS, so I have a simple function where I can pass a component and some tokens in um, and it generates the HTML. The question is, where does that HTML come from? So in this example, um, we have a template of HTML. And so this is very similar to the HTML that you're going to see in a um, theme file, uh, but it's actually uh, tokenized. So you can see in here, um, I didn't tokenize everything, I just tokenized a handful of them for the for sake of example. But you can see I have like, you know, the dollar graphic permalink, uh, I have post title, post excerpt, and the ID. So I have a few different ones in here. So uh, essentially what the simple JS library does is when it loops through, it takes this piece of HTML and injects the tokens into the, the values into each one of those, and then it takes that HTML and sticks it into the DOM. That's what's 
doing in short. So when you do all those things, you immediately have those posts showing right up. Um, you can see that there's, um, you know, you have their classes and everything, so inherently uh, it will just style to your theme and run from there. So that's how you load those. So the next thing that we can do is actually add a little bit more active interactions to this. Um, and what we do is we can add um, essentially uh, an event uh, right here. I'm using click. So when you click on the dot more post object, um, we want to load more posts. Um, so it's relatively straightforward. The cool thing about the uh, WordPress uh, API client JavaScript JavaScript library, sorry, uh, is it gives you the ability to just call it dot more and it loads more posts. Um, so you can um, paginate this as you need to do five, load five, load ten. Um, you can do that when you make your first call, um, or you can do it within the more parameters, which you can look up uh, with the line library documentation. Um, but what's really nice is now I can keep this really clean. I know I have it just loading, um, which is I, it's a, another piece of code I just wrote so that we can show like an animated GIF that the page is loading while it's retrieving information from the server and pulling it back. Which is what you often see. So I have it. I have a function that hides and shows that. You know. um, so yeah, we just call it dot more, and so that way every single time you click on it, it's running this and it loads more posts and renders it back in the DOM. And, um, the page never loads, and I wish I could show you an example right now because you can see exactly what this does. Let's try it one more time. Okay, so I have the one, and so like, like I said, that last, when you click the, the interaction, so that event list, I click on it, if you notice it loaded the GIF, and then while it was doing, the GIF is showing, it retrieved the new posts, and then it re-rendered them. So now I can just continuously hit more, and it's reloading more posts right on the page, and not reloading. So that is all doing that, essentially, relatively quickly, but it's, it's actually pretty clean. You can do this stuff really, it doesn't take a lot of code to do something like this. Yes? Are there any hooks that you can use to say you want some custom data on your posts? Um, can you add that to the API somehow? Yes, we're going to get to that. Cool. Yeah, that's, we're going to talk about extending. Okay. Correct. Okay. So that is my, uh, my mini example that kind of walks through taking a page and rendering it. Um, some of the other things that we can also do, if you want to take it one step further, um, is you can actually, so if you're doing like a single post and people are making comments, normally when you fill up a comment, um, the page reloads, right? They have to like hit it and like submit the form and it reloads the person's comment. Um, there is the ability for people to submit comments with the REST API. Using the same stuff we did, you have the ability to do that. And I'll show you a small code snippet and how that works. Uh, but you can also manipulate and push it and not just retrieve it. Everything that we did there is just retrieving it. All right, so have you guys heard of Word, uh, WordPress headless or any headless WordPress mm. concepts? All right. <laughs> I know, I, 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 was, I kind of wanted to see where we're at, but I, I saw it. I was, I was sitting outside. It's like a slide about headless. This is going to be fun. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit differently, though. Um, I'm going to give you the example. So WordPress as a CMS, we we love WordPress because the CMS capabilities. That is at its core what makes this an amazing platform. Um, is the fact that we have the extendable, manageable tool that is easy to use, right? And that's what we're familiar with is this screen, which um, this is going to be very archaic soon, but um, <clears throat> but this is kind of where what you see now, and this is what we're familiar with, and this is how you modify a post. Um, but what if we wanted to create a completely custom admin for our clients or for myself? Um, what if we wanted to have an admin, like we use WordPress not just for um, a personal website or a business website. We use WordPress for e-commerce, we use WordPress for forms, right? And so like maybe I don't care about posts. I'm an e-commerce blog or site. I'm an e-commerce site and I just want to know about my finances. I want to know about my products. I want to know about those things. I want to manage those differently. Like the admin right now for WordPress is basically built 
um, to manage the objects and you know the posts and pages. But there are better UIs depending on the type of sites that we have. The nice thing about the REST API is now we can create those new APIs or those new um, admin interfaces. As an example, you can create an admin interface just like this on top of WordPress, and it looks completely different. But it was structured and organized in a way that um, meets the needs of that particular site. And you know, mentioning Gutenberg. Gutenberg is a new admin interface for managing your posts and objects. Um, and that is right now being built on the REST API that we're talking about today. Um, so this is a new interface that is using this REST API. And yet, as you can see, it's a completely new experience that's being created. Um, and that's why I think it's going to make this as powerful. I think Gutenberg is just the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg of where we're going and where we could go. Because I can see, totally see this admin interface. There's going to be like a series of admin interfaces depending on the type of site that you're building in WordPress. Um, that is optimized for those reasons. And that's what the power, I believe, can happen with this API, or the rest of the API. All right, so let's talk a little bit about manipulating data. I know I kind of alluded to it. Um, so you can see I'm using the put command, or the put method up here, and not the get. Um, and this is how you uh, try to modify it. As you can see, when I try to make this in a, a request, it says, sorry, you're not allowed to edit this post, because I'm not authorized. Uh, so again, as long as you are including this, um, we don't authorize that. And going back to that object, we have that nonce that we need to include. Again, we don't have to worry too much about this if you're using the client library, but if you are building this on another third-party system, let's say we're not using WordPress and I'm using an iPhone app and I need to access this data, then you need to kind of be aware of some of these things. Um, okay, so then, uh, this is, I'm not going to go too much into this, but I just want to mention, mention that if you're using Postman, um, I was, at first of all, I'd say you should use Postman if you're working with APIs. Just straight, flat out. Um, it is by far an amazing tool that I'm running to stuff that you can do all of the time that makes developing with an API so much better. Um, so I should have alluded to that at the beginning, but I'm saying it now. Um, but when you go to try to test things with your API, you want to modify stuff using Postman because, like I mentioned, the RESTful API is a complete, every single call is independent of itself. We have to have an authentication involved to modify the post. And to do that, you have to essentially add a cookie as well as add a header to the request. Um, and so that's what I'm showing you guys here, which is we have to provide that authentication. Um, so what we do is um, I, I basically load, uh, I log into the site in my browser, I go into my console, and I um, grab the cookie from my browser, as you can see here, which is the WordPress login one. Essentially copy and paste that cookie into Postman, and then once I have that, I can make my request as if I'm logged in. Um, so there's more, I don't want to go too far into this, but I just want you to be aware of that, and again, I will show the slides so you can look through these things because there are links in here. Um, so that you can see, you can retrieve them, you can create posts. They show you all the examples for every single one of these. I just showed you a few, but you can do all of those things. Um, and then taking us a few steps further, you can build into WordPress inherently, you have all of these objects, the posts, categories, tags, comments, and so forth. So all of those are available to you, even within the client library that we talked about. Um, Oh, there's an example of the updating the post using the, uh, the client library, the back home. So you essentially retrieve it, and then you can set the title, and he just hits dot save. So it's really clean being able to do that. And then those all those that you can ask questions. All right. So that is, uh, in short, the um, the headless concepts where you can really create some really cool interfaces from it. Um, so let's talk about taking this one step further and extending this beyond your basic objects and saying essentially what you want to do by adding more stuff to it. Um, the first thing you can do is if you're adding, if you're using custom post types, um, you can essentially automatically tell that custom post type to add itself to that client library. So if you're creating something new, such as pets, is this example, um, if I want to do dot pets dot fetch. You have to kind of tell WordPress, like, I need to add this to the rest of the app. So there's an example. So if you want to do something like that, 
Like that inherently isn't going to be there just because your custom post type is there. It won't be there. So what we have to do is essentially give it a rest controller. So we I have this OEP rest attack controller um, into when I register my custom post type. So that's what you'll have to do. And then this is going to help you add into that. So that, that's the first thing that you can do. So if you're doing custom post types, that's the first thing that you'd want to do. Um, the second thing that you want to do is, let's say we just want to create your own API endpoint that is not a custom post type, it's completely like something out, like whatever you want to be. Like it's, maybe you're taking two different post objects and you're manipulating them and retrieve information in a totally different manner. Um, you can do that as well. So let's talk a little bit about developing an API endpoint as a whole. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the method. So you should try to stick to the rules of the get, post, put, delete um, when you're using those methods based off of retrieving, creating, updating, and deleting. So use those. We want to use the authentication as needed. We want to validate user data. So we want to make sure the data that's being sent over is good um, before we do anything. Then we perform the actions, and then we return the JSON response. So that is the life cycle of what you need to do in an API endpoint. So. Um, this is probably not an example. I, I realize this afterwards, I probably shouldn't have used pet as my two examples, but I was in the, the pet thing. But let's say that we want to add a custom endpoint that just retrieves something called pet name. It's not title, it's not post title or excerpt. This is just its own little object. Um, so here's an, uh, a quick example that you can see here. Um, there is an action called REST API initialization, I pin it. Um, and you can register your own route. So the route is the URL that you're going to eventually hit. Um, so you can, what you do is you give a version, and then you give the route, and it is um, it allows red indexes, so you can do things like the ID that's dynamic in the URL. Um, and so you generate that, you declare the method, and you, then you declare the callback, which is essentially the function that's going to retrieve the data. So that's what we're doing here. So that is where you can see down below this function got some pet. I'm just having to retrieve post in this example. Um, and then you can see that I'm pulling it together and then I'm generating a WP REST response, which is an object available to you with the WordPress that helps generate the response. Um, you set the status code, typically it's 200 as a success, that's what you use, like four hundred a week for like non authentication type stuff. Um, and then you return. So it's relatively straightforward. You, um, you're registering the route and then you're returning the data. Okay, so let's pretend that this call, though, I only want certain users to be able to. Because if you just did that right now, there's no authentication. Anybody can just start adding stuff to your site. That's not good. Um, you don't want that to happen. So we have to do the, uh, we have to have some type of authentication. So there is another um, parameter, the register route called permission callback. And in the permission callback, you do your um, capabilities check, essentially. So right now, I'm using the current user can edit other posts. That's the, the capabilities I happen to choose for this example. Uh, but you could whatever capabilities you have in the system, you do your check there. This is going to use that authentication thing I was talking about. So we have that cookie, we have that nonce that's being passed in the request. The WordPress REST API is going to check to see what the user is, and then check to see if that user can has that permission or capability. And if they do, it allows them to continue and do the action that you did. If they don't, it's going to kick back to them and it never hits that other function that we talked about. It just returns that you can't do it. Um, and then the last thing that we can do is validate the data as well. So there's two things, permissions, validation. Um, and again, we have this parameter, octaves, args, and then you can say whatever the data someone's pushing over, pet name in this example, and then validate all that. So the data comes in, and I'm just doing a very simple thing here, which is like, is numeric, but you can put whatever code in there. And you can do this for every single variable that people are posting or pushing to your um, API to validate the data because maybe there, there's a variable they're called status, and you only want to allow them to send the status over as published or draft and no other junk. You validate that. If it doesn't validate, it kicks back the user and says this, but this field doesn't match to our validation. So once you take that off, um, you put it together, and again, I guess I already walked through that, but this is returning a response. There it is, putting it all together. Um, I know it's really small to look at, but essentially you can see that we have the route, and we have the, the args for the validation, the validating of the data, the permission callback, and the retrieval of the data. So that is, in a nutshell, how you create your own custom endpoint. Um, and this is 
very simplified, but you can really hopefully see that what the possibilities are and where you can go with that. Um, and you can basically do endless operations if you need to. So that is everything I got. Uh, any questions? I know I did cover a lot, um, but there's also limited time and I am open for um, hanging around or if you guys want to talk about anything specifically. Yes? Um, when do we um, bury PHP edition? When do we bury PHP in? How soon? In, in, I guess in your mind, uh, all jokes aside, you know, have in, in the projects you've been working um, and, and switching to RESTful, um, are you are you convinced that this is the way to go and, and to get rid of PHP methods? You're not going to get rid of PHP because you still need to write the PHP to do that. If you're using WordPress, you're using PHP. So I would say if, if we're going to, if you don't want to use WordPress, then if you don't want to use PHP, you don't use WordPress. <laughs> I don't see anytime soon that WordPress is not going to have PHP. I understand there are more JavaScript in WordPress in general. Um, and I think the REST API is still. Even though it's been around for a couple of years now, I still think it's like super early, and I'm really excited to see what more people do with it, such as these custom admin dashboard. But you still have, like I just showed, all the, I mean, we're using PHP libraries, we're using the WP, you know, all the, the hooks to do, generate the route, to, to do all the authentication, do all the validation, that's all PHP, right? So you still have to write PHP, at the very least, to write the API. That's the language that WordPress is found in. Yes? I'm curious why you put the API calls in the theme itself. Yes, that would be what my, would be my preferred method. That's what we do normally. Um, I wanted to do everything in the theme and have, like, and for, for today's sake of conversation, um, my goal was to show everything because you can technically do it all in the theme, yeah. right? Um, but yes, what I would typically do is I would build a plugin that would be a theme guide, and then I would build a theme that talks to that plugin essentially. Um, separation of data and design, yes. That is what our company does. Like, we build RESTful APIs as a plugin. And then we build a theme if it is, you know, we need it, but that's that's exactly our logic. Works very similar. I mean, obviously the way you create a plugin, you use the same all the same stuff works for you. The one thing to mention though is if you're gonna do like the um, if you're gonna you wanna use like the what was I gonna say? Some of the templating things I was showing you, right? Like that's specific to the theme. So because like I want to render data in a specific way. Then you would want to make sure that that's done in the theme, not in the plugin. So that's the design part as opposed to. But in order to reuse those API calls, you should put it in the theme. Because if you want to use it on different devices or whatever. Oh, it, it would still work on other devices, even in the theme. Because it's just a, the endpoint still exists. It's not as long as the theme is like. Because the API is literally just retrieving it, it's, it's just the back and forth of data objects, right? If you have the ability to do all of that, manipulate those data objects, regardless, excuse me, regardless if it's you know, a theme or a plugin that's generating those API endpoints, it's still I can still go build a iPhone app that talks to that API even though it's built on theme. That doesn't change. It's just the it's more of a code thing. Like, a, like if you want to if you're trying to organize your code as a developer of the API, then you can build it as a plugin and then build a theme that talks to that. You can do that, but you know if you're if you're literally just building an API that is specific to a theme, you can put it in a theme. Does that make sense? Yeah, but normally I would want to be tied to that theme forever. I want to be able to port that. Yeah, and that's why you would a better design would be just put it in a plugin. But it, you know, for the sake of today, like it's that's talking about building two different things. And, but yeah, you could take a, a plugin. And Building the plugin, and it should be the preferred method, um, especially because, like you said, you change the theme, all that goes in the theme is lost. Yeah. But at the same time, if you're changing the theme, the theme that you were writing is probably going to be different, and maybe it doesn't even reference it. If you have. So you, you have to kind of think about what you're doing. It's not like if I go change it, if I have the, the even if I took the API that I built into a plugin and I change the theme, the theme has to know the API exists and it has to talk to it. You know what I mean? If I'm using it on a um, so with loading the posts via Ajax, better for that user because it's faster, 
Are there any negative consequences on SEO from that? Uh, there, yes, there can be. Um, if it, so, yes, because uh, um, so I'm not for because like, I know things are always changing, right? With with like the way Google indexes stuff, because I know that they index some things via Ajax, some things they don't. Um, but yeah, there are some things that um, when it's when the crawlers, depending on how the crawlers are going to pick some things up, um, and there's a couple different ways that this is handled um, depending on. Like you're showing. I'm trying to think of the, the, the current method because I've seen a few things that were done. But there's some things that you can put in the site so that when the, um, the crawlers hit your site, that it will retrieve the information for them that you want to retrieve. So, um, what I do is I typically err on the side of um, if I'm trying to go for SEO, I typically am going to load it right into the HTML because it's a lot easier, especially if you're doing even like, you know, Google has like these structured data. I need to generate structured data for, for posts and stuff like that. Like those type of things are easier to generate with PHP, and like those are more SEO friendly. I think if you're building more like administration tools or you're building more um, app type functionality, then the API becomes a lot more powerful. Would it be worth it to write the API and then load that via PHP for, for initial load, and then have the more button for the more posts? Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, we've done that plenty of times. And now what we do is with the, because um, you're already making the HTTP request for like a single post because you have the route that you want for the URL, um, we typically would load a single post with, you know, an API version of the Ajax. It's just like you're making the one API request anyways for that post. So, but the instance that I want to show more like this example, yeah, I could load the first five with PHP and then just load the next. I was just wondering, you, I mean, you had like two examples that you went through. One was where you were um, setting up a API request through using Ajax and going through more JavaScript type you know, syntax to pull in that information and put it on the page. And then the second one that you did to the custom endpoint, you used more of the, um, like the WordPress um, you know, codex to, to write out that portion. JavaScript. Yeah, Java, right, JavaScript. And, um, I was just wondering, what what is really the difference between using those? Like you, they both essentially do the same thing, or, or that's how I'm seeing it anyway. So I'm yeah. just wondering, it's, what, it's a what great question. really is the difference of going through the Ajax version as opposed to going through like the you know the WordPress version of it? Yeah. So when we build an API, that API is now accessible by any thing that is created out in the internet, anything, right? And the example with the simplified, or I guess the cleaner approach with the defined library, is specifically if you're working within the word, that one WordPress website. If you are building like an iPhone app, you have to do, well, I don't necessarily wouldn't use jQuery, you have to use the commands within Swift to do the, the requests. Um, but if I were to build another website that was not within the WordPress ecosystem, even on a completely different domain, I would have to use the jQuery example because I don't have that library. So and then that's the difference. You're going through like the difference between levels and frameworks, essentially. Yeah. yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? I know there's a lot. The hard part about it was like I want to cover so much, and it's so hard to cover a lot in 35 minutes. So, um, yeah, if you guys have any questions or you feel good, I'm, I'm going to be around all day, so we can always chat more. Yes. It sounds like you kind of are more in on some of the future of where WordPress is going. Do you see any applications or, or any limitations with SSL versus just non-SSL? I, I just see so many API kind of application things are just, you know, if you're not SSL at all, you can't even get into them. And I wondered if, if there's any direction to kind of start locking down within WordPress some of these APIs to say, look, if you're not you're going to use the API to get step that out. I, I believe every single HTTP request should be SSL. Every. But you don't see anything right now within the structure of the API? Well, that has nothing to do with it. Like, that is like with your, like the way your server host is set up, right? So for the hosting, that's where the SSL comes into play. That, this is outside of the control of that. Like, we can't control SSL. Essentially, we can 
write code that says don't make requests um, to other third parties who comment as well. But like I, everything should be secure in terms of I mean you're pushing data out there. I can I've given people some examples of like even like simple things like a contact form. Well it's a contact form I don't really know as well. I'm like, well technically I can show you why they sent someone's email and phone number that is submitted in the contact form and now that person's information is compromised. And that's a very small piece of information but there's value in that. And so like everything should be Easier to like do this and um, yes, SSL. <laughs> yeah, I think people, yes. I was going to say, I just want to kind of give a note that's just maybe one more question and then okay. break some people have time to. Yeah, all right. So one more question. Right. Like, you have to let every 
that user, but technically a device, no. Right. right? And when you open up the browser, you have no information about the current user. So, yeah, so yeah. Cookie, you're yes. 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 Now, what you could do is, if there, so here, here's, a, here's an example, which is, you if someone's logged in, right, and let's say the current website you first are doing it, there is no information being collected, zero, right, zero. And when they log in, that's when all the data is going to start to collect. Once they log in, you decide, because now you can at least you have the ability to try. That way you can go log in, and then you have a window, and then you can decide what to try. But it still requires them to do something to tell them that they are a real person. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no other way to do it. Yes. It's already there. It's, it, it's creating a cookie. So the WordPress creates a cookie. So it has a 